a bored man is a dangerous man. We've heard this quote before and we know it's intuitively true. When you're bored, you eat too much. You get into trouble. You message that person you probably shouldn't be messaging. And more often than not, unless you have some system in place, being bored brings you back to the infinite scroll. But I found a way to replace these bad habits brought on by boredom with a positive one. That is my pocket notebook for contemplation. Hey, welcome to Park Notes. I'm Parker Sedicase. I'm a philosopher and theologian, and this is a channel where I help you study and think more deeply. In this video, I'm going to help you master boredom so that you can use it in order to contemplate deep ideas instead of developing bad habits like turning to your phone for that infinite scroll. So in this video, I'll show you how to keep a pocket notebook for contemplation. I call this my contemplatio. I use the Latin because I'm pretentious and it motivates me to take it more seriously. So in order to get the full concept of a contemplatio or a pocket notebook for contemplation, first I'm going to talk about the pros and cons of boredom and why I think you should be bored sometimes. Then I'll get into the concept of a pocket notebook for contemplation. I'll give you guys some examples from my own pocket notebook, and then I'll finish by going over some of my favorite pocket notebook brands. We got a lot to cover, so let's jump right in. So as we get into my method for staving off boredom by reflecting and contemplating on deep ideas, I want to say first and foremost, boredom in and of itself is not a bad thing. Sure, it can lead to some destructive behaviors, but boredom can actually be a really helpful tool for self-knowledge, getting to know who you are, what you are, why you believe what you believe, why you desire what you desire, and why you act the way that you act. And boredom can also lead to deep thinking and a development of your own ideas. So not just why do I believe what I believe, but should I believe what I believe? So I actually recommend you schedule boredom into your day. Go for a walk without your phone or put your phone on silent or put your phone on airplane mode and go out and let that stream of consciousness flow. Let your ideas come to you. Think about things. Look at that bird. What do you think about it? Consider Consider your life. Consider your station. Where are you? Who are you? What are you? Think about these things. Boredom is a beautiful tool for self-knowledge and deep thinking. After you're done with your walk, come back and write down some of those ideas or bring a pocket notebook with you like these field notes wallets, which have memo books in them. I always have one of these with me, but I also make a living by my ideas, my thoughts. So I have to collect them all the time. This is actually what I've been using for my wallet lately. There are all my cards and money and stuff, but here's a Field Notes memo book, 48 pages. And this is like my backup. Look, if I have a good idea, I need to write it down. So I like to bring these memo books with me. My audience actually gets 10% off. I love being able to go out and find you guys discounts so that you can get a discount on the stuff that I enjoy myself. So check these out, link in the description. Now I've also done videos on deep thinking philosophy journals and books of soliloquies. This is getting to know yourself more deeply. This is thinking about your ideas and your thoughts more deeply, coming to conclusions on what you believe and why you believe it, thinking through new ideas and figuring out what you know and don't know. I don't want you guys to think this current video is an attack on boredom simplicator and boredom in general. No, boredom is a good tool. It can be a very good tool for generating self-knowledge through soliloquies or generating new ideas through a deep thinking philosophy journal. If you guys want to find out more about keeping your own book of soliloquies, then check this video up here. And if you want to find out about about keeping a deep thinking philosophy notebook, then hopefully it's up here as well. If not, check the description for those videos. But you can't be bored all the time. You can't always be writing soliloquies or going for boredom walks or working in your deep thinking philosophy journal. What about those situations where we don't have time to sit down and write? How do we stave off the boredom then? That brings us to pocket commonplace books and pocket contemplation notebooks. Now, I've already done a video on this pocket commonplace book. This is my pocket commonplace book of Proverbs, my Sententiae Gnome, my book of sententious maxims, my Flores Philosophorum. It's a book of pocket proverbs. So I collect my favorite gnomic statements, my favorite proverbs. I put them in here and then I bring this with me so that when I'm bored and I'm tempted to pull up my phone and fire up that infinite scroll once more, I can pull out some of the deepest wisdom from the greatest minds in human history. I'll read through one, two, three, four of these, and then I'll reflect on them. And that helps me stave off that boredom or those awkward situations where I just want to be lost in my phone. So if you guys want to learn more about keeping your own book of pocket proverbs, check out this video linked up here. But let's dive in deeper to a pocket notebook for contemplation or a contemplatio. Now, I like the Latin because it's kind of fun. I need to give myself a reason to be using this, and this motivates me. Using Latin is fun. 
I don't know, it kind of sounds like Harry Potter or something, but a lot of my favorite philosophers and theologians use the Latin, so I feel good when I use Latin or Greek or Hebrew. Now this notebook is a cross between a commonplace book and a compendium. I've been working on these distinctions throughout my videos, so they, they've changed over time, but what's common between the two is they're both notebooks and they're both collections. A commonplace book is usually a collection of quotes, and you can have either printed commonplace books where you just collect the quotes, or like a manuscript commonplace book where you collect the quotes and your own ideas about those quotes. Whereas a compendium is a collection of detailed information on a particular topic, which is systematically presented for others. They're meant to be more comprehensive in scope. So think of like a handbook on North American turtles. That's going to be a compendium. It's a collection of detailed information on all the turtles in North America. It's presented systematically, probably alphabetically or regionally, and it's meant to be comprehensive in scope. All the turtles in North America. So my contemplatio is kind of a cross between the two. I put ideas in here. I don't always put quotes. I usually just abstract the ideas out of the quotes and I present them systematically, but this is not meant to be comprehensive in scope. It's not based on one singular idea, but it's ideas I want to reflect on. Ideas, thoughts, concepts I'd rather be chewing on, thinking through, rather than firing up that infinite scroll and scrolling my life away. So I will put quotes in here, but as I'm thinking through the definitions of commonplace books and compendiums, I'm not sure where it falls. It's somewhere in between the two. It's really important for me to get clear on the concepts. I don't know why. If you guys don't care, then don't even worry about it. Just get your own pocket notebook for contemplation. So that's the idea. It's really simple. Get yourself a pocket notebook and fill it with ideas that you want to think about. Read books, read articles, listen to podcasts, abstract out those ideas and put them on a page or two of your contemplatio. Bring it with you everywhere you go. And when you're tempted to pull out that phone to check for your alerts, to scroll and scroll and scroll, don't do it. Instead, bring this out and think back on those ideas that you find important, that you find meaningful, that you find worthwhile. Going from compulsively scrolling to intentionally reflecting on ideas that you find worthwhile, meaningful, desirable, impactful, that's a huge swing. It's the first step in utilizing boredom to your own advantage. I'm bored, but I'm not going to go to some shallow amusement. Instead, I'm going to go to amusement. I'm going to think. I'm going to muse and chew on ideas. That's awesome. So that's it. It's a really simple idea, and it's a really simple method. Get yourself a pocket notebook. Fill it up with some of your favorite ideas. You can put quotes in here, or you can do the hard work of abstracting out the ideas from the quotes and see how short you can get it. One page, two pages, three pages. But some of you guys really like when I give examples from my own notebooks, so I want to walk through a couple of those, and then I'll leave you guys with some of my favorite pocket notebooks that you can use for your own contemplatio. So here's the first entry in this pocket notebook for contemplation, this contemplatio. And it's one of my own ideas about Pythagoreanism and Stoicism. It's kind of surprising to me that Stoicism is having such a moment right now. Everyone wants to talk about Stoicism. Everyone thinks it's super awesome. And it's pretty cool. But there, I think there's a lot of problems with Stoicism. And so I'm wondering why Stoicism has found such a audience today, but Pythagoreanism hasn't. Sure, maybe Pythagoras was a little bit of a cult leader, kind of weird. But Pythagoreanism as a whole is, is a pretty awesome philosophy. They were substance dualists. They thought that the mind was an immaterial thing. Some people categorize them as being part of the Orphic Greek religions. And Pythagoras taught that the rigors of mathematical thought is an activity that purifies the soul. I'm not a huge math guy, but that's pretty fantastic. Deep, abstract thinking actually purifies your soul. The Pythagoreans heavily influenced Plato, and Plato is the biggest figure in all of Western philosophy. I think that Stoicism is committed to fatalism, hard determinism, and physicalism, and so I'm not sure there's actually room to control your emotions in the way that the Stoics suggest. The Pythagoreans, on the other hand, hold to an immaterial mind, which may not be subject to the laws of physics. So there might be more room to harness your own emotions to have control over them. If that's the case, then I think Pythagoreanism should be preferred over Stoicism. Now, that's an idea I need to think through a lot more, but when I'm bored and tempted to pull out my phone, this is an idea I want to think about. I've been thinking a lot about Cartesian minds and transcendental egos. That's the philosophy of Immanuel Kant versus the philosophy of Rene Descartes and their theories of personal identity and the self, the ego. I had Luciano Floridi on my podcast, Parker's Pensies. You can find a link to that somewhere up here, but I've been thinking a lot about the life cycle of information, especially because I run this channel, which is like notebook philosophy. So what is information? How do we capture it? How do we reuse it? How do we process it? Those things are very important for me to get clear on. I also have been developing my own history of AI. 
And I've been pulling from folks like Andy Clark and his history of cognitive science, along with Margaret Bowden's history of AI and Melanie Mitchell's. So really briefly, you know, some people will find everything tracing back to Plato, but I found that Descartes might be the father of artificial intelligence in that he's the one of the first to talk about it in his philosophy. Descartes specifically was talking about androids and how we might be able to tell the difference between a human and a humanoid robot, something that visually looks just like a human, but inside is a machine. Descartes basically argued that in order to pass a Turing test, the android would have to be artificially generally intelligent, and that's practically impossible. So that's one way that we'd be able to tell an android from a human. I recently wrote a Substack piece on this where I analyzed Descartes' arguments and his reasoning, and I think that ultimately they fail, but Descartes a genius and he was talking about this in 1637, which is crazy. You can find the link to my Substack article in the description here. Leibniz also talked about artificial intelligence in 1646 with his Mill argument, and he actually argues against the idea of a machine being able to think or perceive things. So the rationalists of the 1600s were arguing against the possibility of artificial intelligence, but the first positive movement looks like it started with Lady Ava Lovelace in the 1840s and her friend Charles Babbage, who tried to invent an AI with his analytic engine, though it looks like that gears and cogwheel device was unsuccessful. Fast forward all the way to 1936 with Alan Turing's formalization of computation, which was a huge stepping stone for progress in AI, and then a short step to the 1940s with the invention of digital computers by people like John von Neumann and Alan Turing. 1956, artificial intelligence was coined by John McCarthy at the Dartmouth workshop on AI, and then I've thought through some more ideas, like the fight between the good old-fashioned AI folks and the connectionists, all the way up until the transformer neural net revolution that started in 2017 with the Google paper attention is all you need. That brings us to November 30th, 2022, when OpenAI released its chat GPT model, GPT-3, which set the whole world on fire. So I want to be an expert in the philosophy of artificial intelligence. I'm not claiming to be anywhere near an expert today, but I want to be. So when I'm bored, I'd rather pull out my contemplatio and think through the history of AI, then become a victim of AI on social media platforms which want to lure me onto their platform and keep me there as long as possible. So for all my theologian friends, I have uh, the Neoplatonic Trinity. The Neoplatonists also had a view of the Trinity. They, they appropriated the One, which is kind of like the Platonic God or, or Plato's Good. They appropriated the Mind or Nous from Aristotle's Intellect. That's like Aristotle's God, and they appropriated the world soul from the Stoics, the Logos. So some have called this the Plotinian triad from Plotinus. These are the kind of things I want to turn to when I'm bored. So again, the concept is super duper simple. Get yourself a pocket notebook and fill it with your favorite ideas that you want to reflect on. So as I finish up here, I want to leave you guys with some of my favorite pocket notebooks so you can get started with your own contemplatio. This is a Midori MD notebook. It's their pocket size. And I have this in a leather cover. This is from Stride Ridge on Etsy. I'll leave a link in the description, but you don't need a leather cover. Midori also has paper covers, so you can find these. Again, links in the description for all these products. If you use my links, then that will help support my work. So I appreciate that. I showed you guys the Field Notes wallets with the memo books in them. I really, really like these. And these come with a 10% off discount with the promo code Parker Notes. So that's super cool. Field Notes also sent me some other really cool ones like their Foiled Again notebooks, their limited edition Birch notebooks, and these Chicago notebooks. I love these ones so much. So you can grab one of these and fill it up with your favorite ideas and turn them into contemplatios. Also, if you like moleskin notebooks, I've been using these ones for years and years and years for pocket notebooks as catch-all systems. I personally love these, but if you use a fountain pen, perhaps you won't like them because I think it does bleed through just a little bit. But if you wanted a leather cover for your moleskin, Murdy Creatives are the best. He's got this really cool system of leather clasps and a Parker pen ties everything all together here. That's pretty sweet. And you can put your moleskin right in here. This is another one of my sponsors, so they're offering 10% off your entire order with my promo code ParkerNotes at checkout. Anytime I can get you guys a discount, I'm going to try and do that. So check out Murdy Creative, check out Field Notes. Lastly, a lot of you guys have recommended that I check out Stology. Stology? I'm not really sure how to pronounce it, but it's another really great company. And these things are super thick. I love the grid notebook here. I haven't used this one, but I used the larger one for Deep Thinking Philosophy Journal. So that's another one that you may want to try. All right, guys, so that's it. It's a really simple concept. I hope that you found it helpful. I hope that you all start your own pocket notebooks for contemplation, your own 
contemplatios. If you guys have made it this far in the video, you're awesome. Leave me a thinking emoji in the comments. I want to know who the real ones are. And let me know what you like about the concept, whether you think you'll use it yourself or maybe some things that you think should be changed about it. I always love hearing from you guys and we can all learn together in the comment section. So leave me a comment. If you haven't subscribed to this channel, make sure you subscribe so you don't miss out on any future tips and tricks for studying and thinking deeply. But that's it for this video. I'll catch you guys next time.